Most words do not have a single fixed meaning. So the subject of this talk arises because I'm going to raise the question, is humanism a religion? And when I say humanism now, I've, I've changed hats. I'm not talking about Jewish humanism in particular, but humanism in general, <coughs> which includes, but it's not limited to, Jewish humanism. Well, the thing you have to realize in general is that meaning depends on context. And this is particularly true of the following very slippery terms in the field that we're dealing with. Religion. <coughs> to an Orthodox Jew, a Reformed Jew is not religious because he doesn't observe all the commandments. To a secular Jew, a Reformed Jew is religious. Looking at the same person, Reformed Jew from two different aspects, you get two different apparently contradictory answers, but they're not contradictory because the word changes its meaning with the context. So, another slippery word is humanism. Is humanism the opposite of religion? Is it the same as atheism? Is it similar to humanitarianism? Again, depends on the context. And then we have those terms that for years have given me a lot of trouble and I'm still not sure I understand them, maybe because I keep uh, losing sight of the context. Religious humanism versus secular humanism. You hear that a lot and I'm not sure that it always means the same thing. So let's take the word religion, which supposedly is the opposite of, of humanism, and let's ask what are the defining characteristics of religion? <coughs> what do we think of as the things that determine whether a particular uh, organization or concept or philosophy is or is not a religion? So I'm going to suggest five separate criteria. And I'm not suggesting that <coughs> this is an exhaustive list, but it happens to be the five that I was able to think of. Uh, and if you can think of six and, uh, or seven or more, uh, I'd be happy to hear what they are. But this is what I was able to, to say. One, a shared belief in the supernatural. Most people <coughs> would reflexively think of that as a, one of the criteria that defines the term religion. So usually, <coughs> There is a, at least one deity, monotheism, polytheism, but at least one. Usually, the deity has some influence on human life. Not always, you can have uh, deistic religions. <clears throat> you can have deistic religions where God is kind of the uh, the absentee landlord, maybe maybe he's even gone to sleep. But usually, uh, the deity has some influence on human life. You can pray to him, he listens to your prayers. Uh, he may not answer them, but uh, sometimes he does, and so on. Uh, that's criteria number one, a shared belief in the supernatural. Criteria number two, a social structure based on the shared belief. Now, Usually the social structure includes congregations. You may not always call it a congregation, but at least uh, some religions do that. And usually clergy or other leaders, sometimes clergy and other leaders. The third criterion is a philosophy, consistent with the shared belief, which is the basis for a system of ethics. E.g., God wants us to obey certain rules of conduct that are important to him. Not because they're good for us necessarily, although in some religions that does come into play. Not because uh, we want to, but uh, because that's what God wants of us. I once asked uh, my Orthodox Jewish friend, uh, why do you not eat pork? Uh, does it have something to do with trichinosis? Or something? He said, no, it's God's commandment. Well, why does God command it? I don't know, I don't care. The fact that God commands it is enough. This is a very educated person um, and a very intelligent person, but that's his worldview. God commands, I do, end of story. 
<clears throat> the fourth criteria is a culture based on the shared belief, based on the social structure, and based on the philosophy. And the fifth criterion is a common tradition for celebrating holidays and life cycle events. Holidays, occasions when we all get together uh, and celebrate life cycle events. We, the, the, they use the word hatch, match, and dispatch. Birth, baby naming, marriage, funerals, and there are various other life cycles as well, coming of age and so on. So let's look at these five criteria and see whether humanism, humanism in general, uh, matches them or not. All right, criteria number one, a shared belief in the supernatural. Christianity is a clear case, Judaism is, Islam is, is Buddhism a religion? Well, that's a little ambiguous. There's no deity in Buddhism, at least as I understand. But most people would say yes. Um, and it does have this, this uh, uh, supernatural notion of reincarnation, in fact, multiple reincarnation. So Buddhism is, is a little bit ambiguous. And then we get to humanism, absolutely no, right? We have a, a clear negative on that one. Buddhist, uh, I'm sorry, humanism does not have a shared belief in the supernatural. On the contrary, there's a shared disbelief in the supernatural. <coughs> All right, criterion number two, a social structure based on the shared belief. Often it is a formal organization uh, and or hierarchy. Uh, does humanism qualify uh, <coughs> criterion number two? Uh, congregational humanism, Society for Humanistic Judaism and its various congregations uh, certainly does. There are other uh, congregations that are humanistic and Jewish <coughs> that do not belong to the Society for Humanistic Judaism. They would qualify also. Unitarian Universalism, I would say yes, although with the qualification that there is a spectrum from uh, kind of a mild form of Christianity which does not adhere to the belief in the divinity of Jesus, but it's kind of Christian looking all the way over to out and out atheists, uh, or at least humanists who belong to the Unitarian Universalist Church. So these are the kinds of organizations uh, that are referred to as religious humanism. And, then, and I forgot to mention ethical culture, which came up in our discussion this morning, which is very similar, uh, but has its own particular uh, slant on it. Um, and then, there are organizations which can be referred to as secular humanism, and I think this helps uh, to, to understand the difference between <coughs> religious and secular humanism. CSJO, which someone mentioned this morning, the Congress of Secular Jewish Organizations, those guys, they were, were very similar to political clubs. It's, they're very Jewish organizations, they're interested in Jewish history, but they're more interested in political activism. They do not have rabbis leaders, uh, they, they don't pray, they don't, uh, they don't participate to any great extent in, in the uh, traditionally religious Jewish things, but they do have a lot of religious, uh, a lot of Jewish cultural events, uh, and they carry forward that part of the Jewish tradition. And there's a similar organization called the Workman Circle. Both of these are politically active and somewhat to the left end of the spectrum, and that's what they're really interested in rather than the, uh, the, uh, what we would regard as a religious organization. So the difference between uh, religious humanism and secular humanism seems to be more organizational than ideological. Ideologically, they're pretty much on the same page as far as it not having uh, a God. <coughs> okay, so humanism doesn't meet criteria number one. It does meet criteria number two pretty well. Uh, even better than some of the other organizations. Criterion number three was a philosophy based on the shared belief, which is a basis for a, a system of ethics. Does humanism qualify? Yes. That's what makes humanism different from, from atheism. It's not just that they don't believe in God, they have to find a way to justify a certain life stance, a certain way of life. <laughs> so 
So what you have is a human-based ethics rather than a God-based ethics. Humanity is the measure of right and wrong. What is good for humanity is good. Not, we don't care whether God wants us to eat pork or not. Are we gonna get trichinosis? That's the issue. So, uh, and lately that's been broadened out, by the way. Uh, there are some people who say, uh, this attitude is too human-centered. It uh, doesn't take into account the welfare of the other animals and the plants that share this, this planet. So we have to uh, become more ecology conscious. We have to consider not that humanism is the, uh, the, the center of all things. We have to look at humanity in its context as only one of the organisms in this planet. And, we have to, and our basis of what's good and bad has to look at the entire uh, biological context in which human beings are embedded. And, and I find that kind of an attractive idea, too. And, uh, and here I'll repeat something I said this morning. Our ethics is be good for goodness sake, not for God's sake. And I do think that uh, a legitimate claim can be made that this is a morally superior attitude because we are good because it is the right thing to do and not because we're going to be rewarded for it or punished if we don't measure up. The fourth criterion was a culture based on the shared beliefs, based on the social structure, and based on the what is a culture? Let me digress for a moment. I looked it up and it's in a dictionary and it's defined as a set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices. And I think that's a pretty good definition. Does humanism qualify uh, as a culture? Well, congregational humanism certainly does. Um, so humanistic Judaism, Unitarian Universalism, uh, and I would say even the CSJO and the Workman Circle, those, those kind of political club organizations do also. Now, when we're talking about a culture, I want to tell you what role culture plays in human uh, I think I mentioned that there was this Harvard conference uh, oh, about three years ago. It was the last one that Rabbi Wine uh, ever attended. Uh, and he spoke, and Salman Rushdie spoke. So we had a humanistic Jew, a humanistic Muslim, and this poor Unitarian Universalist minister who wrote a book on UU on U -U humanism spoke, right? And he was kind of a, a very uh, in, uh, intellectual kind of speaker. And he came right after these two very bombastic <laughs> guys who were great showmen and so on. And he, was, uh, he did his very best and he had good things to say, but it was really interesting. <coughs> the focus, the spotlight was on Sherman, Sh uh, uh, Sherman Wine, uh, the, the uh, famous rabbi, and on some of Rushdie, the famous uh, Muslim author. In any event, Shal Salman Rushdie suggested uh, that there should be a new holiday that we atheists, humanists, can, can uh, celebrate during December. They want to call it Atheistmas. <laughs> <laughs> and he thought that was a good idea. <laughs> Sherwin Wine spoke up and said, no way. <laughs> and I'm quoting now. Atheist Christians want to celebrate Christmas. And atheist Jews want to celebrate Hanukkah. That to me epitomizes the role of culture in religion and in this definition of religion that we're, we're trying to sneak up on. All right, so much for the fourth criteria. The fifth one is a common tradition for celebrating holidays and life cycle events. Does humanism qualify? Yes, again, congregational humanism, uh, religious humanism does. Uh, the humanist movement, both the Jewish version of it and, and, and the uh, general version of it, have marriage officiants. Uh, humanistic Judaism has people, not only rabbis, but uh, various uh, trained leaders who are authorized by law to perform marriages. And of course, they can also do baby namings and, and uh, lead holiday celebrations and funerals and, and so on. The American Humanist Association, which is by no means a, a religious organization, 
Commission. They're all, uh, by the way, also has uh, trained officiants and, and uh, it recertifies them. I don't know if it's every year, but it certainly it, it enables it. So. And it, this, this raises an interesting question about how this fits into the legal system in the United States. I'm told that Nevada, under Nevada law, you have to be a clergyman to perform a legal wedding. And the American Humorist Association says, wait a minute, wait a minute what about our marriage uh, celebrants? Uh, they're allowed to perform weddings in the other states. Uh, I don't know the whole, but certainly most. Uh, and you can't shut us out. That's a violation of the First Amendment. So the American Humanist Association is now, or at least some of the, the people in Nevada who are sympathetic, are engaged in litigation with the state of Nevada to say that it's a violation of the First Amendment to say that you have to have a traditional <coughs> god belief kind of religious person uh, to perform marriages, and a celebrant who, who is an atheist cannot. And, I, and as a lawyer, I would say that's, that's absolutely right, because the First, Man, First Amendment said you can't have an established religion, and it certainly seems to be establishing a little piece of religion, at least, uh, to say that you have to believe in God in order to marry someone. So we've looked at the five criteria. We've measured those five criteria against uh, humanism. And now the question arises, is humanism a religion measured by those five criteria? <coughs> it has met every characteristic except the first one. In other words, four out of five. Now, by my mathematics, that's an 800 batting average. So that's pretty good. I would, you, you, that would get you to the major leagues. Uh, and also, I would say, well, this isn't really one of the criteria, but uh, the Internal Revenue Service, uh, using the Society for Humanistic Judaism as an example, classifies that organization as a religion. In fact, for tax purposes, it's, it's a church. Uh, would that withstand First Amendment scrutiny? Absolutely, because the Constitution would forbid uh, the United States government or the Internal Revenue Service, which is part of it, from saying, you can't be tax exempt because you don't believe in God. That would be a gross violation uh, of, of our separation of churches. So the next question is, are we going to expand the definition of religion? Are we going to settle for four out of five? And my vote, you and your title to your vote, mine would be yes. I would say that humanism is a naturalistic religion, non-theistic, non-supernatural, uh, but whether, as I said, it's, whether you feel comfort, comfortable with that or not uh, it is a matter of your own choice. I can imagine that many people who are religious in the traditional sense, in the god belief sense, would be uncomfortable if we humanists <coughs> call ourselves religious, because that would violate their notion of religion. But make no mistake, there are plenty of humanists who are equally uncomfortable with it, because they <coughs> became humanists to get away from all that. I hear that all the time uh, in my dealings with the society. Um, well, there was a big controversy when the Secular Coalition for America was formed. And again, to refresh your memory, this is uh, a coalition of uh, national organizations that banded together uh, to form an organization that would lobby for the atheist humanist point of view in Congress. because. Uh, as we know, we are a, a, a small minority and politically weak, uh, and uh, everybody takes it for granted that uh, our point of view is not important. So we tried to do something about that. And after the Second Coalition of America was born, the Society for Humanistic Judaism um, applied for membership. And some of the people in the coalition <coughs> said, wait a minute, do we want these religious guys in our secular coalition? And the vote was not unanimous, I'll tell you. But we got in because we believe in the same things and we're for the same things as they are. We just uh, are organized around the other four criteria, right? And we broke the ground and later ethical culture was warmly accepted with open, open arms. And now you have two religious organizations in the secular coalition for America. Well, I'm almost done with this linguistic analysis, but let me expand it further. Can a theistic group be called theist? 
they would meet only three of the five criteria, but still, that's what, a 600 batting average? So a belief in a deity not, uh, would not qualify that. I'm sorry, it would, would qualify. Uh, they would have a social structure, they have a philosophical basis for the ethics, they have a culture, they have a tradition. What makes them humanistic? If they say, I believe in God, or I believe in the supernatural, but my God is not the measure of right and wrong, is not the, 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 the criterion on which my ethics is based. Human values, human welfare, maybe this person is a deist, maybe this person's God just isn't very bossy like the Christian God or the Christian God. <laughs> doesn't tell you what to eat and drink and, what, and most of all what to think. He's just up there, uh, and so we're left to our own devices. So we look around, try to figure out what's good for God, for, for human beings, and, and maybe for the ecology. I would say uh, that the theistic person of that kind can be humanistic. So a four out of five is OK. Is three out of five is OK? Maybe, but then what are we going to call them? We can't call them religious humanists because that's taken. We had enough trouble just figuring out what it means. A theistic humanist, a humanistic theist, take your choice. Is it a contradiction in terms? Maybe, but as we saw this morning, words do not have fixed meanings. Their meanings depend on context. Well, a couple of observations just to conclude this talk. Uh, rabbi Miriam Jarris, who succeeded Sherwin Wine as the, the rabbi of the Society for Human Security, refuses to answer God questions. Whenever she comes to town, she comes to Sarasota, she's going to talk to our congregation, and the local paper goes out and they interview her. And they say, is it true that you Jews in this group don't believe in God? She refuses to give a categorical yes or no answer to that question. She says, that's not what we're about. It's not what we, uh, that's not our organizing principle. We don't care whether there's a God or not. We're about human society and human ethics based on what's good for humanity. And they get really mad because they want that, that sound bite, they want that quote, Rabbi doesn't believe in God. And that becomes the headline, not on page one, certainly, but maybe on mm -hmm. page three of the, of the religion section. But she refuses to confirm. I happen to know, personally, she doesn't believe in God. But that's her personal belief. It doesn't represent necessarily the organization. And I happen to know, because one of them is, is the sister of my wife, that there are people in our organization, the Society for Human Institutions, who do believe in the supernatural, maybe not a traditional God. But they find that the humanist outlook is very much to their, or maybe it's just their social group, and maybe she likes the food. <laughs> Humanist Manifesto 3, which is the successor to the original Humanist Manifesto of 1933, defines humanism as follows. And I will quote, humanism is a progressive philosophy of life that without supernaturalism affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives personal fulfillment that ascribe to the greater good of humanity. I like that definition because it has a little bit of atheism in it, a little bit of agnosticism, a little bit of religion, <coughs> not obviously, and a little bit of humanitarianism, which is sometimes confused with humanism, and a whole lot of human intelligence. We argue a lot in the humanist movement how to define ourselves. And there's one school of thought Rabbi Wine uh, subscribed to this very forcefully. He did everything very forcefully. He said, don't tell people what humanism is not. Don't concentrate on what we don't believe. In. Tell them what we do believe. In. And certainly that's good advice, and it's good public relations, and it's, it's sound philosophically. But it just won't work. That's like asking a fish to define himself without using the word water. We are swimming in a sea of religion, and the thing that defines us, that separates us from all the other fish in the ocean, I'm mixing my metaphors now, 
is what we don't believe. However, for ourselves, for the, the kind of society that we wanted to build in general and for the kind of micro society that we have in this room and, and amongst ourselves, what we should remember is what we do believe. So what I like about that Humanist Manifesto 3 is it packs everything in there. It says the progressive philosophy of life without supernaturalism. There's the negative. Let's get it out on, 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 on the table. But then it goes on to say, affirms our ability and responsibility, and it brings in ethics, brings in personal fulfillment. You're entitled to be happy. You don't just have to go around being a goody-goody, you can do both. <laughs> All right, without supernatural, uh, supernaturalism, responsibility to be ethical, personal fulfillment, you can, go to, you can play tennis instead of going to church every night. And that aspires to the greater good, uh, good of humanity, because after all, the basic idea is that Human welfare is the organizing principle. So in conclusion, the meanings of the words religion and humanism fall at various places along an ideological spectrum. And there is no simple binary distinction. The different meanings of, of words that's that's definitely true I find that uh, um, when you're communicating to different audiences you know they have different um, expectations of the meaning of the word religion and so when I find myself talking to um, uh, just kind of Joe Joe public here in central Ohio most of them <coughs> would think that that first criteria of religion being that it's supernatural is the most important one and so what I usually do when I'm talking to somebody who's religious doesn't know anything about humanism I'll say well humanism is like a religion and and, and I say it's like a religion because you know we, we are a community we, we do service projects we support each other we we have similar beliefs but we don't believe in God and so that kind of gives them the whole series of definitions. That's a good way to do it. You know, the function of language is communication. Mm -hmm. Whatever gets the message across performs the function. Alternate to religion. Mm -hmm. yes. Alternate to religion. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, well, I, I, I like the way he said it. <laughs> <laughs> so where do ethics come from? And what I consider good, and my, what I consider uh, good for the humanity, might not be what <coughs> Hitler thought was good okay, for humanity. No, I, I answered the first part of that question this morning, where did that come from? But now you, you've gone a level deeper. What if we disagree? We humans, 
we've gone out and well, no, it's not we, what do we disagree with God. What do we disagree <coughs> amongst ourselves? I think that's good. I think we ought to have a lively, continuing debate about what's right and wrong. And if it lasts for the rest of human history, that's OK, too. I think it shows we're using our intelligence. And we are trying to create and keep a just and ethical society. And as we invent new things, the context, the issue changes. Uh, in vitro fertilization, uh, cloning hu of human babies. Uh, should people be, if we figure out a way to live forever, should we do that uh, and not leave room on Earth for new generations? Science will continuously present us with, even if we solve all the issues of ethics that have ever confronted us up to this period of time, based on some humanistic form of ethics, and we settle, and the Muslims and the Buddhists and everybody else agreed with us in the West. The next day, some scientist is going to come up with an epic-making discovery, and uh, we'll have to uh, extend our ethical, we'll have another ethical issue. That's good. That's the human condition. We have this intelligence. We have this, this basic ethical insight that what's good for the human culture and the, and the ecological context in which it flourishes is our criteria. How do we apply that, that criteria? That's hard. But we, shall not, we would not, should not shirk from those hard decisions. But still, there are and, and I am a humanist. I can stand up like I am a whatever. Um, but I have these, well, I guess I have a lot of thoughts going through my mind as to, I don't need an authority. I don't need God to tell me what, you know, what is good and what's bad. But I'm going to say, I say it's good for all white people to walk could, on the right side you, of the street, and you say it's good for all black people. We're going to, to disagree. Walk. That's right. We're going to disagree. But who, who's right? We both say we're good. We both say this is the well. Good. I'll, I'll give you two choices. Let God decide. I don't think you're going to take that alternative. The other alternative is we'll keep arguing about it, and people of goodwill will work out an answer that works. It may not be the right answer. It may not be the one answer. But that's the human condition. We live with doubt. And we can do that. Yes? Would you please read that definition that you read? The from, the Amer from Humanist Manifesto? Yes. You mean you haven't given <laughs> it to memory? <laughs> Humanism. Give me the page. <laughs> I want to say something in response, Barbara, to what you're asking. One of the one of the things I think that differentiates us from a group of people who believe that God has defined what is right and wrong, and the holy books tell us what is right and wrong. What separates us as humanists and humanistic Jews, we are encouraged to question and wonder. And I know that in my personal development, my own ethical system, while it's similar to what it was when I was 16 and 21 and 35, it's also evolved because I'm talking to you and you're pointing out things I wouldn't have thought of and Sharon's giving a different take and it's in the community of our own experience that I grow and learn and that's partly why I need to be in a community of people where it is safe and Courage to wonder and quest. That's why I'm saying we are a community of wondering Jews. We get to question and question each other in, in civil ways, though. Not in meaningless. Yes, yeah, that's a great answer, both of you. Uh, but what's true in ethics is true, you know, all of human knowledge. It's all uncertain. We just have to try to figure out the best we can. But uh, one thing, another element that Barbara may not have may have been leading up to is that we look at ethics differently than many people in the theistic community. So you kind of run against a brick wall in some cases. You know, I, I yeah. think, I think uh, it's right because it's good for humanity. They say, well, that doesn't matter. What matters is what God says. Well, look, you know, look at the How do you go from there? For example, 
Uh, that, that little piece of jelly has a soul, and you can't touch it, and that's, and that's, that's the theistic answer. Uh, now, what's our answer? All right, could you abort a fetus the day before birth? Well, it's not a fetus, is it? Obviously not. That's, that's a, a human being. Uh, a day after conception, we would say no problem. Now, where do you draw the line? So the Supreme Court drew the line in, in Roe v. Wade at three months. Is it an arbitrary line? Yes. What do you mean it's wrong at three months and one day, but it's perfectly good at three months minus one day? Well, we just have to deal with these issues. We have to draw the lines. But that shows that we are trying to be an ethical community. And we do the best we can. It's a practical world, whatever works. If there yes. are elements that I, I have to inject in here that seem so important, one of the parts of becoming a mature, mentally emancipated <coughs> person is to be able to tolerate uncertainty. I have my own worked out scheme of ethics, but that might not be, it might not all be exactly the right thing to apply. But as we mature, we're able to say, this is, I can't be absolutely certain about everything. I have to develop these muscles, like in a gym, to tolerate uncertainty and have the open-mindedness, which is a core humanistic belief, to be able to say, I'm wrong if I think I'm wrong later, I'm sorry I don't know, and all of those things that allow us to keep growing and learning, because the central part of humanism is personal growth and learning and responsibility. I won't say anything else. Now. In the back. <laughs> you mentioned how the science may come up with some new idea. It seems to me that religion has moved along this progression too, from totems, paganism, to uh, Habarare, to Christianity, and the Mormons say they've come up with a new and better idea, and Scientology has said they've come up with a new and better idea, and who knows, maybe tomorrow the, uh, somebody from outer space will come up and land and say, here's our new idea. So how do we juxtaposition the ideas of humanism with all these ideas of religion? <coughs> I don't think we really care what they're thinking. But they interact and they deal with you because when I worked in a booth at Comstats this year, that was one of the questions I kept getting bombarded with was, what do you believe in Jesus? And then it seems like that's a very important thing to a lot of people. It is, but it's not important to us. <laughs> yes, this lady. Um, I think almost all religions, except for maybe the Unitarians, have an aspect of religious belief that has to do with mysticism, something transcendent, something involving awe. Great question. And um, I didn't hear that discussed at all today about the humanistic thought. Let me talk about that. Uh, <coughs> actually, Rabbi Wine talked about is there uh, spirituality in humanism? And again, we have that spectrum. There are people that want to, we have nothing to do with spirituality. That's all this soul and, and, and all this, this uh, mystical stuff that's outside physical nature. We don't believe in that. And of course, that's right. But look, <coughs> you like Bach? Jo Johann Sebastian Bach? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know my do, thoughts on this. Do you like? Gorgeous sunset. Have you ever been to the to, to Swan Lake, the valley? I mean, whatever turns you on, right? There's something that makes you feel just glad to be alive, uh, makes you feel, feel as though you're part of a, of a world which is basically good. I know there's a lot of evil and tragedy in it and so on. But isn't it every, every book, God, it's good to be alive. That is spirituality without super. I should. It, it, it's the emotional side of the human animal. Okay? Just because we're humanists, just because we're rationalists, doesn't mean we don't have emotions. Religious people, in the narrow sense of that word, theistic people, I should have said, uh, identify their emotional responses with God. 
we can identify our emotional responses with, uh, with nature, uh, with human creativity, or with just the joy of being alive. My answer is, we, some, people, some people criticize, let me start that sentence over. Some people criticize us as being dry, intellectual philosophers with no blood. We're not. We're living, breathing human beings with emotions. And if, we, if in defining and living our humanism, we forget the emotional, the loving, the appreciating side of our natures, we're shortchanging ourselves. Because it's there, we shouldn't repress it. We do have humanistic spirituality. We're human beings. Yes? Um, I wanted to comment on the, the, the moral discussion. And that's that I think, well, my point is maybe a little bit weaker, but um, yes, religions have some sets of rules, but their rules aren't as rigid as they, they appear to be. I mean, they interpret those rules. And, you know, if you look at the, uh, the range of beliefs on just, you know, the Christian religion, you know, whether being gay is a sin or whether it's not, you know, they're, they're not all in agreement with that. You've got to look at the Old Testament, and some people say, well, that, that's meaningful, and others say that it's not. And so um, it's kind of a false dichotomy to say, well, they have rules and we don't because, well, they have their rules, but they make of their rules, they interpret them just as humanists interpret nature and, you know, human needs and values. So uh, I don't think they're on quite as firm of a footing as it may seem. There's a range of variation. On Thursday night in Sarasota, my wife and I attended a religious service at the United Church of Christ in Sarasota uh, for the uh, gay is it something, uh, anyway, it's the, it's the United Gay Community of Sarasota, gay, lesbian, and transgender. And the United Church of Christ was there, uh, Society for Humanistic Judaism was there, a whole range of uh, Christian uh, uh, beliefs were represented, and of course the Unitarian Universalists. All their clergymen got up and spoke uh, with warmth and passion about how we're all one one species and, and, and gay or straight or lesbian or whatever. Uh, we, uh, we're all uh, in the same boat. Uh, and uh, you know, there was some mention of God and, and some people did and some people didn't and so on. But we could all coalesce around the, the, the uh, principle that we should just let everybody be who, who they are and, and who they want to be. And uh, one young man, a minister, a Mennonite minister, and said he'd been uh, a minister for uh, this small congregation, Mennonite congregation in Sarasota. By the way, there's a lot of Mennonites in Sarasota, a lot of Amish. Uh, and he said, uh, I came out to my community, and then I came out to the, to the authorities of the Mennonite, and they immediately withdrew my ministerial uh, certification and, and rejected <coughs> my congregation. But my congregation stood behind me. I don't know if they're going to make it financially. And by the way, he's getting married next month to his, his partner. But of course, the marriage is not going to be legal uh, in the great state of Florida. I say that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he touched our hearts. To a man, the audience stood up. The other speakers were good, and we applauded them. But he got a standing O uh, because we could, could see uh, what a difficult situation he was in. And I went up to him later and I said, keep up the fight. And he smiled at me and I said, I didn't have to say that. I, I know you will. And he will. Uh, wherever it leads him. So uh, I guess the point is the theistic religions differ enormously among themselves, even within the Mennonite denomination. So uh, there, are, there are good people out there who believe in God and we have to make common cause with them. Bob? I think a lot of this discussion uh, in my mind creates or, or uh, makes me arrive at another criteria you have mentioned. I'm, I'm having uh, trouble hearing you. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. I, I was saying that I think this discussion leads to a, a conception of another criteria you have mentioned, and that's uh, that's the word around how we arrive at knowledge, and I think that's one of the great uh, things that oh, distinguishes good. us. That's a sixth criteria. I was hoping somebody would, would uh, do that. 
it's either authority or it's not, you know. And uh, you know, it's it's reason. And I think it was it was Dewey who uh, defined knowledge as the result or residue of one's experience, and it's not pre-existent. And uh, yeah, I would just offer that as as the six criteria. Okay, so what are the really criteria just, for I, religion? Is that they accept knowledge? Um, Based on authority. Authority. That's not true of all religions, though. Well, there are many religions out there, for example, who, who, who accept evolution uh, and, and without supernatural intervention. But I think the, the primary uh, factor is that uh, truth is arrived at by an authority, whereas in humanism, it's it's the result or the it, it's. It's not authority. It's, it's experience. It's reason. It's, it's scientific method. And I think that's that's a, a, another factor that distinguishes us from from uh, religious people. I would not use the word religious, but that's another argument. Yes. Well, uh, I've heard some people make the case. Could you speak they, louder, please? I heard some people make the case that they didn't feel comfortable using religion. One because you say it meets four <coughs> out of five conditions. Well. You open it up to like a voting system of how many of those you meet. Maybe you allow in too many other absurd things like uh, football, I don't know, knitting, I don't know, other <laughs> things past the criteria. Can't you gotta me. put against a test of you know the absurd things you would not want to call religion and see if you're now if you allow this partial absurd. Are you saying that football is not a religion? <laughs> 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 Stabilized windows in the stadium? <laughs> <laughs> this room was uh, the remnant of the hunters and gatherers of 3,500 years ago. And we sat around and said, we got to quit killing each other for land and stealing each other's wives and all those things. We ought to come up with a decent moral code. And they did. Let's assume that, because I can, or any of us can look at. Torah and see a 3,200 year old code. And it seems to work. It has a lot of other stuff in it, as we described. But how would we pitch this to the rest of the hundred plus thousands of people out there <coughs> who were hunters and gatherers and got tired of killing and being killed? And they took this concept Maybe they arrived at the agreement around this table. It's a small enough group that you can arrive at some agreement. Uh, or maybe there was some divine, as they defined divine, presence that gave them that little piece to go ahead. But it happened, and it happened in a, among a group of, of Jews uh, they call themselves Jews. They had a history, and that history has come down through the ages in a lot of different forms. But how do you sell this idea? Uh, maybe God is, exists and gave them that push. Maybe he didn't, or she didn't. Maybe there is no God, and the group came up with it. Let me see if I understand. Maybe it doesn't matter that religion isn't true. It's useful. Okay. Absolutely. Right. Well, there may be more than one way to sell an idea. Agreed. And, it, and for example, the people of one village figured out that it's advantageous to stop killing each other. Well, the people in the adjoining village are not stupid either. And uh, eventually, people get the idea. No, no one group has a monopoly, a monopoly on human intelligence. So you don't necessarily need religion as the organizing principle for spreading the concept of ethics to a wider uh, range of, of people. Uh, history shows that, we, that our ethical concerns have spread from the tribe to the village to the city to the nation state. And it's the process of spreading the world. Now, that's one point. The other point, I think, is 
what happens when one religion uh, becomes an organizing principle for a system of ethics within its own religious community, but becomes the instigation for terrorism and murder for another? Uh, just to take a totally fictitious example, Islam. <laughs> Uh, we start getting t uh, car bombs in Times Square. So my point is you can question the long-term effectiveness of religion as an organizing principle for uh, organizing ethics. Uh, wouldn't we be better off in the long run, even if not in the short run, to have it based on the welfare of all mankind and not the welfare of one person? No question about that, because the history of murderous uh, religions uh, at least is a little over 2,000 years old, with Christianity, uh, who swept across Europe and wiped out the Jews, among others. And, 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 the, and the, the Jewish Bible says, well, let's go down to Jericho and slaughter every night. I mean, and, I have to and, detail Well, that. I was, that's yeah. the next step, because you right. can go back and you can look right. at as far back as you the can Jews go. conquered Right, the, the, the area. So now I'm becoming suspicious that religion really is effective <coughs> as a vehicle for organizing ethical communities. In fact, it has a dismal, atrocious history. It's good within the in-group. It's very mm -hmm. dangerous outside the in-group. I'd like a better alternative. How about humans? But how are you going to sell? That's the next question. Well, that's fine. Yes. We have, we, have, we have lots of tools that we didn't have before. The internet, Twitter, Facebook, yes. Don't we already have that? I mean, in the Constitution of the United States, I mean, isn't that what a statement of ethical behavior between human beings? And other, I mean, the, the British uh, uh, doctrines and things like that, the, you know, all countries have some type of way to behave ethically amongst one another. But, but we've I also decide, found out scientifically that uh, groups do succeed, that do learn to interact successfully with one another. We have been shown that if you cheat somebody, then it comes back to you. Kind of like a hero <coughs> of but, but I agree with this gentleman that you need a sales pitch because yeah. every lawyer will tell you that the Constitution is a piece of paper, and the contract is a piece of paper unless people have formed an intention to abide by it. Well, I'm saying that we have a history already of s secular interaction, and uh, some people are misusing yeah. it. I mean, we have right. conservatives but, but, that but are saying- The point is, we, we've, got to, we've got to sell that to the world. Right? We've got the principle, but how do you get people to abide by it? And I agree, that that's, that's a problem of public relations and sales An unsolved. Could you speak louder? But until you figure it out, you should just live by example. Okay. Okay. How are you holding up? Uh, I'm fine, but I think uh, everybody's done. <laughs> <laughs>